Kathy Wood sees Bitcoin going beyond a million dollar valuation. How this year's ETFs and halving change the supply demand dynamics. Yes, our target is above that. Think about how many people know, even know about the halving this time around when they didn't even know what Bitcoin was four years ago. They didn't know what it truly was. It's Friday the 8th of March and you're watching Markets with Madison. The price of Bitcoin is rallying after the launch of spot price exchange traded funds and ahead of this year's halving event. With the production of Bitcoin set to change and demand seemingly ever increasing, what could that mean for its price? The fourth halving event is set to occur in April this year. It's when the block reward earned for mining Bitcoin is cut in half. At the moment, the daily production cap is 900 Bitcoin. That will soon drop to 450. Only 21 million Bitcoin total can ever be issued. It's hard-coded into the network. There's already more than 19 million out there. The halving will make the last few million more painstaking to produce. It's not expected to end until the year 2140. It means the price to produce Bitcoin also increases. The amount of compute required to mine Bitcoin, its hash rate, is already around all-time highs. That's good for security of the network because it had taken an enormous amount of effort and electricity to bring it down. Historically, halvings have eventually boosted Bitcoin's price. And today's landscape is different than any event before. Supply is even more limited, as ETF managers BlackRock, Fidelity, ARK and others are sucking up liquid supply. ETF approvals have given retail and institutional investors a means to get exposure to Bitcoin without having to own the underlying asset. Kathy Wood of ARK Invest is behind the third largest Bitcoin ETF. I spoke to her this week. Kathy, thank you so much for coming on the show again. Amazing to chat with you today. Oh, my pleasure, Maddie. Kathy, last time we spoke must have been a little over a year ago now. At that time, Bitcoin ETFs did not exist, and the price of Bitcoin certainly was not where it is now. So congratulations on the launch of your ARK21 shares ETF. How have the inflows you've experienced into that fund compared to your initial expectations? Well, we didn't know uh, we didn't know until the very end what GBTC was going to do. If GBTC, which was the Grayscale Bitcoin Investment Trust, had cut its fees to where we are or even close, um, the story would have been very different. I think inertia would have kept uh, kept uh, clients in that fund. Uh, but uh, GBTC has donated quite a bit of share. It's at about 1.5%. Uh, we're at 21 basis points, ARKB is, uh, because we're looking at, uh, at Bitcoin as a public good. It's the financial superhighway. And the most important thing to us is that we provide access at the lowest cost to entice as many people as possible to participate in what we believe uh, in hindsight will be considered a revolution, a financial services revolution and a monetary revolution. What was that figure of inflows that you hoped would happen when these ETS were first approved in January this year? Well, we were... I, I guess what we were hoping is that uh, as uh, GBT was uh, seeding share, that we would be among the top three because we, three, we, we believe that three ETFs ultimately will win. And we are against most expectations and against some very formidable and much larger companies. Uh, we are number three. And actually, our number is over 2.1 billion now. So we've been uh, we've been very very pleased. Of course, BlackRock and Fidelity are number one and number two. They're converting their existing client base from GBTC into uh, into their own funds and attracting new new funds, of course. Uh, but we have a disproportionate uh, amount of new funds coming in onto our platform. How do you know that? How do you know that the funds coming in to your fund and not just GBTC outflows are also not people shifting out of the more expensive Canadian ETFs? 
Well, of course, we don't know all of that, but we we knew how much we were going to convert from GBTC. So, uh, and we know we know that it is a very small percentage of what we now have. Uh, has the rest come from uh, G GBTC from other platforms? That's very possible. But uh, in terms of what we were converting internally from GBTC to ARKB, uh, it was roughly 100 million out of the 2.1 billion. Where do you think assets under management for these funds are going? Not just yours, but all of them. Michael Saylor thinks that they'll eventually overtake the SPY ETF, which is the world's largest, has hundreds of millions of dollars worth of funds in it. What's your take on that? Well, and, and bef before I answer that, I, I do want to give a lot of credit to, to our partners in this David uh, versus Goliath battle. Uh, 21 shares uh, is the infrastructure and ops uh, of ARC 21 shares. And then Resolute is uh, our distribution partner here in the US. So have to give them both lots of credit. And of course, our team, our incredible research team as well. So uh, that done, do we agree with Michael Saylor that ultimately uh, this, this category, um, Bitcoin and other crypto assets could be uh, bigger than SPY? Yes, we do. Absolutely, we do. And uh, Bitcoin alone is going to be the biggest uh, part of the entire crypto asset ecosystem. Uh, our expectation out in 2030 that it will be uh, a $20 trillion it will be worth $20 trillion. Now, how much will ETFs get of that $20 trillion? I don't know, but that already right there is, if you think about it, it I mean, it runs circles around SPY, number one. And I believe all of public equities globally, no matter what wrapper they're in, uh, are valued right now at roughly $120 trillion. So when I say $20 trillion by 2030, um, that's, a, that's a very big uh, category. How much Bitcoin does your ETF hold now? And if the market for these funds does get that large to, as you say, $20 trillion perhaps, how much could it hold? Well, uh, okay, so the, the, all of the ETFs out there right now hold about 3.9%, roughly 4% as of, as of today, um, of all the Bitcoin outstanding. Now, the really interesting thing about that is if, if you look at on-chain analytics, which our analyst David Puel does for us, uh, you'll see that uh, long-term holders uh, account for... I believe 15, 15 million of the Bitcoin outstanding, roughly 15 million. Uh, total outstanding right now is 19.5 million. And the total that will ever be outstanding is 21 million. Those long-term holders are not selling. That's what's going on with the price right now. Uh, and the flows into the ETFs um, have which have taken the friction out of buying Bitcoin and which can be used as collateral for loans, whereas Bitcoin itself cannot, uh, suggest to us that, you know, that added one and a half million to go in Bitcoin uh, is going to have to cover a lot of uh, investors, institutions, and so forth. In other words, the price will have to go high enough to rest the 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 supply some of the supply out of long term holder hands and just to clarify long term holders and again you can track this on chain uh, they have not moved their bitcoin from their wallets in uh, at least 155 days and when that occurs the odds that they will move their bitcoin go down dramatically unless the price spikes dramatically. So those are the demand dynamics at the moment. And add to that the expected halving event this year. How is the price impact of this year's halving perhaps going to be different this time around because of that landscape that you've just explained? 
Yes, so uh, the having. So we'll go from roughly 1.9% growth in Bitcoin supply per year down to 0.9%. So we will drop below 1% for the first time. And if you look at the long-term history of gold, uh, very long-term, uh, what you'll find is the average supply growth has been roughly 1%. So now Bitcoin supply growth is dropping below uh, the supply growth of gold. That is that is a milestone, I would say. Um, and the other difference here is when the gold price spikes, there's usually a, a mining response and, and the supply spikes with it. That cannot happen with Bitcoin. So it's quite a different dynamic. So the halving is that milestone. And if you look historically after halvings, it's usually been very good for the Bitcoin price. Now, uh, it doesn't happen right away. Uh, I think, I don't know why it doesn't happen right away, but it doesn't. Uh, now that the market's becoming more efficient with ETFs, it might, because think about how many people know, even know about the halving this time around when they didn't even know what Bitcoin was four years ago. They didn't know what it truly was. Um, and if I can just throw one in, in terms of how we try and describe uh, what this monetary revolution is, it's, and each one of these words is important. The first, global, that's critical. Private, no government oversight. Digital, decentralized, rules-based monetary system in history. It is what my mentor and Many people know Art Laffer for his Laffer curve and fiscal policy and so forth. He's a monetary scholar as well. And he said, I have been waiting for this for 50 years, ever since they closed the gold window in, here in the United States in 1971. I do want to talk to you about the fundamentals of Bitcoin, but just there you mentioned mining. And I think maybe one of the reasons that the price comes off initially post a halving event is because the cost to mine, or rather the compute required to mine Bitcoin, its hash rate increases, and it's already around all-time highs. So if less profitable miners perhaps drop off because it's going to become more expensive to mine, they could then offload their Bitcoin into the market. How do you see that potentially impacting the price this time? Yes, that does happen each time. But I think what we have going for us this time is uh, the financial markets. When you've got the entire ETF infrastructure out there ready to arbitrage these sorts of events, um, we may pull forward the price increase and accelerate the transition you're talking about. On the topic of supply, funds like yours are soaking up so much of the on-market liquid supply daily now. And a term that I am sure you're aware of that Bitcoiners often use is whales. And while you certainly hold enough Bitcoin to be considered one, you don't exactly have the ability to manipulate the market because you can't just dump all of the Bitcoin that you own. It's clients that own that Bitcoin, so they'd have to decide to dump it, not you. So if you're not a whale, what should we call Bitcoin funds like yours? Yeah, well, we're representing thousands of people, each of whom is going to make his or her decision about what to do with this Bitcoin. Uh, we, are, we do not control that decision. Our clients do. And they are, they, they are, you know, they are individuals who actually have, you know, they're, they're definitely not whales. They're just tiptoeing into the space. So I don't think you could describe us as a whale from that point of view. I, I, I do think that uh, the concern about centralization with ETFs um, is on the market's mind. I think as more and more people understand that, wait a minute, there are thousands and thousands and thousands of people making decisions here. Number one, uh, we're not making the decision. It is our clients who are leading us there. And if you listen to that Bitcoin brainstorm, you'll see the movement within the mining community to counter what they perceive uh, as uh, centralization. And so it was very interesting to do uh, a, a, a minor Bitcoin brainstorm uh, as our ETFs are taking off. 
Your price target for Bitcoin is bull case north of 1 million US dollars, which I do know depends on institutions allocating some of their funds towards it as an asset class. But many still haven't. Vanguard is actually categorically refusing to at the moment. How much of that institutional mindset shift still needs to happen? And what does it ultimately mean for your price target? Well, I think something very important happened last year in March of 23, regional bank crisis here in the United States, regional banks imploded, some went bankrupt, and Bitcoin exploded. It went from 19,000 uh, to, to more than 40,000. What did that demonstrate? That demonstrated that Bitcoin does not have counterparty risk like banks do. Uh, and so it became a risk off asset before we had just thought of it as a risk on asset when liquidity is flowing bitcoin will be one of the prime beneficiaries but this idea that it is also a risk asset and as we hope we've shown in our own uh, new asset class uh, new asset class paper white paper you know it, its correlation with other assets is so low that uh institutions have a fiduciary re, uh, responsibility uh from an asset allocation point of view to at least look at it and if they want to dismiss it fine vanguard did but what we think that vanguard is doing is well one of two things vanguard has never invested in commodities so it's just treating this like a commodity uh for the most part it hasn't uh, uh, but we think it's a new asset class and they will be, Vanguard will be depriving its uh, clients of access to a new asset class, which if there is, continues to be low correlation of returns, what will happen is those using it will see increased returns per unit of risk. And they will outcompete the the Vanguard advisors. So, you know, I think I think there will become even for Va uh, the Vanguard ecosystem a demand pull. If we can just forget Vanguard for a second, discount them because, as you say, there seems to be many other demand drivers for the price in front of us. So, if you had that bill case for more than one million USD Bitcoin, has your forecast timeline? to reach that price now shortened? Yes, that target, what we uh, evolved in, uh, it was before the SEC uh, gave, us, gave us the green light. And I think that was a major milestone and it has pulled forward the timeline. Um, one thing I will say right now, no wirehouse, so whether we're talking about Morgan Stanley, uh, or uh, Merrill Lynch, B of A, or uh, UBS, or Wells Fargo, uh, no, no platform has approved uh, Bitcoin yet. So all of this price action has happened before they approved it. Um, and so, you know, we haven't even begun. So what's your timeline for 1 million USD Bitcoin now? And is there perhaps a price target beyond that now? Yes, our target is above that. Uh, we've got a 2030 target, so uh, it's well above that. And, and uh, with our new expectations for institutional involvement, uh, the incremental price that, that uh, we assume for institutions um, actually has more than doubled. So, uh, you know, I don't want to give out any particular uh, uh, prices, but because we don't know... Um, how quickly, we don't know how quickly um, some, the, the more independent registered investment advisors in the United States, those platforms are saying, give us three months to do our due diligence. The others are saying we need at least six months. So, you know, uh, I, I would put those in the institutional bucket as well. But in your view, Kathy, all of the factors are moving the price of this in an upwards trajectory. Yes, indeed. Another winner in this environment is Coinbase, which is a custodian of a lot of these ETFs. I know that you are involved in it, but you've also been recently trimming your holdings in it, I see. Why is that? Yes. Um, well, it's called portfolio management. Let's just start there. Whenever we see um, one of our stocks uh, just crushing it, meaning exploding to the upside, caught up in a lot of the excitement, 
uh, we take profits and reallocate to uh, names that are being you know, punished for some very short term reason. So it's it's still number one in the portfolio. We're just taking uh, uh, profits at the margin, still very high conviction. One of the things that's happened uh, since uh, FTX went under and Binance, uh, uh, um, Binance lost its CEO, had to pay a heavy fine. Uh, these other exchanges are losing share uh, and Coinbase is moving more internationally into their territory. Uh, with great success, I might add. And I think one of the reasons is because of its trusted nature. It has tried to be the most conscientious of regulations of any of the exchanges and, and uh, crypto companies out there. Uh, and despite the SEC suing it, the, uh, um, if you look at the way the court cases have gone, they have gone really Coinbase's way. Now, now we'll see what happens when the rubber meets the road and that court case does start. But we think they've, um, they've behaved uh, very conservatively and respectfully, I must say, of regulation uh, and uh, they've tried to earn the trust and now they're um, spreading their wings into the rest of the world and the other, uh, whether bankruptcies or controversies, have only increased their pr probability of success during the next few years. So we think they're going to be the premier exchange in the world. Yeah, and trust is a really important point, isn't it? Because trust is what all of this really comes down to. And a large reason that I understand Bitcoin is performing as it is now is because of eroding trust in the traditional monetary system. I'm not sure if you heard it, but the governor of our reserve bank here in New Zealand, he said something publicly that went viral on Twitter. It was a joke, I'm pretty sure, but if I can repeat it to you, Kathy, he said, central banking is a great business to be in. Print enough money and people believe it. Now, I haven't quite heard you talk about this problem publicly, and maybe I just haven't been looking in the right place, but what are your thoughts on trust in the current system? Uh, yes, uh, we do. You know, it's interesting for me to watch the Fed hold so much power over global markets, whether equity or fixed income. Uh, these are human beings and they're not even following rules. Now they would say, yes, we are 2% inflation. So maybe this one will end up being better than most. But if you look back in history and if you look into emerging markets, the history of fiat currencies is atrocious. Even the dollar has lost 99% of its value since the Fed uh, was created in 1913. I don't think that was. Uh, I don't think that was supposed to be the outcome uh, at, at that point in time. Uh, and and you're seeing some nation states. Uh, El Salvador is using um, as is is using Bitcoin as legal tender or has deemed it legal tender. We think there could be a competitive dynamic in emerging markets in this regard. Uh, not only deeming it uh, legal tender, but also putting some into their treasury to benefit from uh, the appreciation that we've seen. And it could become a competitive dynamic too. I know we're much more attracted to looking at opportunities in El Salvador today because of uh, President Bukele's uh, attitude and em embracing of uh, Bitcoin and everything technology. He's got enterprise zones, he's inviting AI. Uh, so we think this is an innovation movement and we think there will be regulatory arbitrage around the world and those countries that treat uh, it more favorably are going to gain share. This is what worried us so much about the SEC here in the United States. Um, it was treating uh, the, the crypto world like uh, a bunch of criminals uh, and to some extent still is as, as a bit of a poor loser when the courts have ruled, that is not your jurisdiction. You, you just have to say, is it appropriate for, is an ETF wrapper appropriate for this? Um, but we're having many, many other people weigh in, academics, uh, to your point about uh, an antidote to some of the uh, mismanagement of monetary policy that we've seen through history. So you're then telling me that it would actually be advantageous for economies 
if governments or at least companies in those countries held more of their treasuries in Bitcoin. Yes, and when when and and especially emerging markets, if you look at when they get into trouble, it is when they lose when they when they're out of foreign exchange reserves, they have nothing to protect their currencies with anymore. Um, well, if uh, if a, a country's currency is going down, but Bitcoin's going up, that's a huge hedge. It's going to protect them against that uh, a, a, a eventuality. Because what usually happens is the IMF comes in and basically tells them, we want you to increase your taxes, cut your spending. We're going to, put, we're going to regulate you more. And it would be 180 degrees against what I would recommend, but that's the IMF prescription. So to protect against that, uh, Bitcoin would be a very good hedge. Opportunities outside of Bitcoin. The big trend of the moment is AI. What excites you about it? Yes. So uh, AI is uh, top of mind. And many people will say, then why did you pull out of NVIDIA in your flagship strategy uh, we do own it in our other strategies, but as you can tell from our trading activity, which we publish at the end of every day, we have been selling it there as well in those uh, portfolios. Um, the, the companies in our portfolios, we believe, uh, that are going to harness and, capital, uh, hap, and capitalize on AI uh, will meet four characteristics. For NVIDIA to, uh, to deserve this valuation, what I'm about to say also must be true. If it's not true, then NVIDIA does not deserve this evaluation. So uh, we will use Tesla as a, an example. That's the largest AI project in the world, uh, autonomous driving networks. So what, did, what are the four characteristics from an AI point of view that Tesla has? It has deep domain expertise. Uh, it is the only uh, auto company in, uh, that has developed an AI chip specifically for uh, autonomous driving. So it has deep domain expertise and it is taking AI very seriously. Uh, we're all going to be AI companies. We're all going to be impacted by it. Uh, three, it has global distribution, but then most important, it has proprietary data that no one has and we don't think anyone will ever get because Tesla has five to six million robots roaming around the world right now. I have two of them, a Model 3 and a Model Y, uh, collecting data, sending it back every day. So they have orders of magnitude more data than all of the other auto companies and tech companies combined trying to enter this space. Why is that important? It's not the data, the deluge of data. It is the corner cases, those very rare events that happen that only if you record real world driving over billions and billions and trillions of miles will you be able to spot and warn this AI system that this is a possibility, watch out. Uh, no one else can do that. So it, Tesla is a wonderful example of a company that is uh, probably the biggest beneficiary of what AI has to offer. And yet it's getting hurt right now because in the U.S., uh, investors are down on electric vehicles and they're just not looking at the autonomous opportunity. And the same is true in the rest of the world. So um, our, our portfolio is filled with companies that meet those four characteristics or criteria necessary to capitalize on the AI age. So if investors are underestimating the prospects of Tesla, fair to say they're likely overestimating the prospects of an NVIDIA. Uh, yes, it's hard for me to believe that that they don't believe that Tesla is uh, going to be successful at autonomous driving. And yet they do believe that AI is going to transform the world. So, you know, this is, this is the biggest AI project in the world. So if it doesn't work... Uh, well, then um, we have a few more questions to ask about other AI projects. Thank you so much for your time today, Kathy. And I did just want to let you know that you do have a lot of followers here in New Zealand, including a friend of mine, John T, who tells me that he watches all of your monthly videos. So he just wanted me to pass on his regards to you. Oh, thank you, John T. And thank you, Maddie. I, I do appreciate that. Thank you so much. Always a pleasure to speak with Kathy Wood. I don't think I'll ever get used to the fact that I'm allowed to speak with people of her calibre. 
Just one word of caution, though. Kathy is very clearly a bull on both Bitcoin and some of those stocks that she talked about. So maybe just keep that in mind. Now go put your money to work. Thanks for watching Markets with Madison, the New Zealand Herald show for interested investors. If you want to stay up to date with financial markets, click the subscribe button below and you can watch our other episodes here. Stay up to date with all the business news and numbers as they land on nzherald.co.nz.